Hi, everybody. Welcome. How many of you all crowding in? It's such an exciting moment. We've got at least 250 of you here already, and we're expecting more. Welcome to a drink with the Idler. And I'm Victoria Hull of the Idler Academy. Um, we've got lots of regulars, so you know the form. Hi to you. We love seeing you each week. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. We've all Hi, yeah, unmute and say Hi. hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello. 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 London, we want to go to yeah. all those places. We are also in London. So Tom, that's Tom and me, um, a bit separate. So we've got Tom Hodgkinson, the editor of The Idler. Hello. So, Hello, strange Hello. and wondrous beings. Hello, Tom. We have <laughs> our regular philosopher, Mark Vernon. Evening, all. I'm uh, ringing my philosophy sponge again to see what comes out of it this week. Fantastic. Thanks for coming <laughs> again, Mark. And we've got our special guest this week, biologist Merlin Sheldrake. Who I hope Hello. is there. Hi, Merlin. Hello. <laughs> be here. Where have you gone? Where have you gone? Oh, there I am. There he is. Hi, Mel. Over there, I can put it on the. Okay, everybody. So, time to, if you could all mute yourselves now, we'll get quickly over to Mark and some philosophy. Just a couple of little things. Um, if you've got questions for the speakers, we've got a nice Q and A session at the end. We're going to leave a bit of extra time for that this week because. I know lots, there are going to be a lot of questions. Do send me your question in the chat and I'll let you know if we've got time to call you out. And I'd like you, if you are called out, to unmute and ask your question to Merlin, Mark or Tom. Um, so send your questions to me in the chat and uh, that would be great. I'll let you know. And um, for those of you who don't know, how to join the idler, I'll also send you a link because I know we've got lots of newcomers and uh, the idler is a magazine and an academy with now 60 online courses. So that's what we would love you to explore and to look at. Um, and that is the idler club really. But welcome all of you today and over to you, Mark. Thanks, Victoria. Very nice to be back to see everybody again. And I thought this evening I'd give us a little primer on Alfred North Whitehead. Um, because when I read Merlin's tremendous book, it really is tremendous, I felt Whitehead was in the wings. I think he's mentioned once or twice, but I felt he was in the wings. So I hope some of Whitehead's thoughts might launch the discussion between Tom and Merlin, which follows us. If you've not heard of Whitehead before, you might well have heard of his most famous remark, which is when he said that all philosophy is footnotes to Plato. But he was a very significant philosopher um, who lived around the turn of the 20th century. Um, the first part of his life, actually, he um, worked hard with Bertrand Russell, who is much better known, on trying to come up with a theory for mathematics that would make mathematics completely consistent, self-contained, closed system. And him and Russell failed to do that. Um, it led Russell to become a very eloquent journalist, writing essays, amongst others, in praise of idleness, of course. Um, but um, it led Whitehead to embark on a whole new approach to philosophy, which came to be known as process philosophy. And that is what he's known for now, more amongst philosophers and a few others, the more widely. But I think that his philosophy really has got something tremendous to say and it may be that actually it's through reading books like Merlin's that you get more of a sense of it than actually from Russell himself, uh, than uh, Whitehead himself, because um, he's not a hugely easy read. But anyway, look, here's a thought, a few thoughts on Whitehead's philosophy. Um, 
he thought, for example, that our perception really matters. There's no view from nowhere, but we see always what we take to what we see. Um, now, I've been thinking about this week, um, when you see Donald Trump strutting on your television screens, it's quite clear that what he sees, he sees because of what he takes to what he sees. Um, he has survived a close encounter with That's COVID, clear, we presume. That's clear because and because of the person who he is, That's he now, it seems, thinks that he can survive death there and writing ad infinitum it. right it's into the future. Um, that's not just Trump, he's just a rather spectacular example of how what we are greatly shapes what we see. Um, Whitehead thought that's actually true for all of us, which is why we should take good notice of who we're becoming as much as everything else in life. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a message that could be do, do with, with um, hearing more widely now. You know, the culture wars are often, I think, they spring up because we fail to realise that what people see and how they understand the world is deeply shaped by who they are and where they're coming from and just taking that step back can be really helpful actually in otherwise what seem intern interminable conflicts. Um, it's also incidentally why he's the favourite philosopher I think of the psychonauts and um, those who are into psychedelics, um, not least Terence McKenna, who I guess you might talk about later on, um, because you know psychedelics whatever they might be doing they certainly change the way we see the world and um, a philosophy that can incorporate that sense is really valuable. So what did Whitehead see that was rather different? Well, he thought that a fundamental mistake of the Western world is that we have followed this idea that the world and reality is made of bits and those bits hang together as if it was one massive machine. This is the atomism of the Western world. And he thought instead that actually the world is best understood as an organism, as a, almost like a living organism, even all the way down, as well as all the way up. And that it's shaped not because it acts like a machine, but because it acts like a infinitely complex set of relationships. So relationships are what really matters to him. Hence the, what we see is how we relate to what we see. Um, and hence the notion of process philosophy, because that immediately takes you into something that's continuously unfolding. Um, now, you know, this works all different levels of reality. Um, I mentioned Trump. Drugs have been on the news agenda in relation to Trump and how different people are responding to these COVID drugs and how Trump will respond to them. Um, it can be very surprising, actually, to learn that even very common drugs like paracetamol, people respond to them in very, very different ways. It's because when you take a drug, you're putting some kind of agent into a whole system, into your organism, and it's going to react in a myriad different ways. And that's one of the things that Whitehead saw. It goes all the way down as well as all the way up, this relating, this organism that we and the world and everyone else around us is. Another story which um, I felt this illuminated for me this week was a story about touch. There was a run in the last 24 hours of new science telling us that touch really matters. And I thought, what kind of world is it that we live in where we need a brain scan to tell us that touch really matters? And of course, it's the world that's shaped by the machine. Whereas Whitehead would say, look, don't just read the story that tells you that touch really matters. Reforge your whole sense of the world around us. We live in a world of relationship, a relationship of organism. Of course, touch and encounters matter. What Whitehead then went on to say is that this is what he called misplaced concreteness. We treat as concrete that which actually is relationship. So we're very inclined to treat as abstract. Um, we confuse abstractions for reality. Um, another example that came to my mind this week that was in the news um, was to do with the economy. And you might have seen that David Attenborough has had a little run again across the media in the last 24 hours because he's saying that maybe capitalism has become too much of a god um, and it's stopped being our servant. Well, Whitehead would say is that's because we've taken an abstraction, the economy, one way of measuring what's going on in the world around us and producing metrics like GDP and so on. We've taken that abstraction 
for something that's actually real. And it's not real. It's just a way of relating to reality that's got its uses, no doubt, in certain environments, but certainly is not useful in others. And when it takes us away from the fact that we live in this organism, this myriad set of relationships in the natural world, in the spiritual world, all around us, when it makes us forget that, it ceased to be useful. And so Whitehead feels like he was very relevant to me this week again because of his sense of misplaced concreteness. So another way of putting it, um, he thought that relationship and organism is basic. And another way of putting that is to say that experience is basic. Again, it's a sort of strange mistake that we've made that we feel that what's unchanging is what's most basic. And he said, no, 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 what is of the moment experience, what's changing is most basic. It led him to some very fascinating reflections, actually. He thought that, for example, a way to understand past, present and future is not as if it's a kind of mechanical time ticking away like a clock. Um, but he thought maybe that actually the past is the matter, the tangible stuff that's around us, the things that we can touch, that, if you like, is kind of the past made manifest. And he thought that because the present, if you like, is the creative moment. It's the moment of possibility. It's the moment when ideas, um, the organism that's unfolding, starts to become matter, starts to move from the future, which is all that might be, through the present, which is when things come to be, into the past, which is things as we see them now as the tangible matter of the past. Um, you know, if you, it makes sense. If you think about a city or a town and um, the village you live in, um, people imagine the house they want to live in. Um, they get to work building that house around them. It emerges and then it becomes the past, the architecture that you can step into and visit. Um, it's actually a really powerful way of thinking about past, present and future. Um, it puts experience, it puts relationship in the forefront. Um, it also puts creativity and freedom in the forefront as well. Because when you think about it, if that's so, it means that in every moment we can find some degree of freedom that is taking what might be happening in the future, bringing it into the present in order to make it into our tangible reality. And again, you know, this is what relationship is like in friendships, in relationships with our lovers, in friendships with our families. We can often feel trapped by them, of course, but you know, maybe every moment there's actually the chance to react to them even just slightly differently, just nudge that relationship in a different way. And it might change the future um, becoming present, turning into the past. Um, that's certainly, I think, true for how we relate to ourselves. It's at the heart of psychotherapy. You know, you guys may know that as well as musing on the philosophers, my day job is working as a psychotherapist. And I think that this philosophy makes sense of that. Um, it makes sense of life itself. Um, you know, um, I was thinking about this business of touch and thinking that some people, of course, can't reach out and hug and hold the people they want to. But if you think of life as an organism in itself, there's all sorts of other aspects of life touching us. Light is touching us. The rain is touching us. Um, if you start imagining yourself living in this tremendous organism relating to you in manifold ways, then it starts to become possible to think of life not as being in isolation from which you hope to reach out and hug someone to sort of rescue from your mechanical atom atomized state of being. No, Whitehead was saying we're always already touching, relating, we're always already free. And this opens us up to a limitless set of possibilities, you might say, that the next moment can bring, moment by moment. Um, it takes the moment, it doesn't just materialize and happen instantaneously around us. But again, one of the things which I got from reading Merlin's book and from his sense of how funguses operate is that in a way they seemed to me, from what he was saying, to be operating moment by moment, um, exploring the world around them. Um, so I hand, I hand over to you, Tom. Um, you know, I think Whitehead's got something to offer us. He's worth grappling with. I'll put... Um, in the chat, actually a conversation that Rupert Sheldrake, Merlin's father, just recently had with one of the most eloquent contemporary philosophers who tries to explain Whitehead's points of view, Matt Segal. I'll put a YouTube link for that in the chat if you want to pick up Whitehead directly. 
And I hope that you'll be even more inspired to do so, having heard Tom and Merlin talking now. Tom. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yes, over to you, Tom and Merlin. Well, thanks so much for that introduction to Whitehead. And um, let's just say hello to Merlin. Merlin, hi, you're there. Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> you're there. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the proof edition I have of your book, which is brilliant, and um, I think, as Mark said, it is a book of sort of philosophy as well as science and brings the two together. Um, it also has this sort of uh, spiritual dimension, if you like. The phrase on the original uh, proof is there is a life form so strange and wondrous that it forces us to rethink how life works. And the book is called Entangled Life. Now, why did you call it Entangled Life? And what is this strange life form we're going to explore today? Big one. So I called it Entangled Life because I wanted to nod to, um, nod to the way that most fungi live most of their lives, which is not as mushrooms, which is what we normally think of when we think of fungi, but as mycelium, which is um, branching, fusing networks of tubular cells. It's analogous to um, the relationship between an apple tree and an apple. When we see an apple, we're looking at a fruit, we're looking at something which comes and goes within the lifetime of the, the larger organism, uh, which persists, and the tree, the, the branches in the trunk of the tree, that persists. And so with fungi, it's analogous. You see um, the mushroom sprouting out of the ground, but mm. under the ground or in the rotting log or in the piece of bread or, or wherever they happen to be living is a network, uh, of a cellular network called mycelium. And so mycelium lives its life completely entangled with its environment. It pours itself into its environment. And um, it's how fungi feed. We put food in our bodies. Uh, fungi put their bodies in their food. And to do so, they really have to... Um, get inside their, their environment and to touch as much of it as possible, hence their network structure. It gives them a very big surface area. It allows them to, to digest as much of their surroundings as possible. So they are, um, it's an entangled way of life. And so that's one of the senses I meant it in. Of course, there are other senses. One of the other senses is that fungi live their lives entangled with other organisms too. They are uh, symbiotically prodigious and have played major parts in many of these blockbuster relationships that have shaped life on earth they're, they're quite brainy as well but we'll come back to that now um let's talk a little bit about your background and upbringing your father is Rupert Sheldrake um he's a very well-known scientist a sort of anti-Dawkins he's famous for his idea of morphic resonance and he may he may be in the audience this evening I'm, I'm not completely sure whether he, he's there or not um and you had people like Terence McKenna I think coming around for dinner now Terence McKenna everybody Mark just mentioned him. Whitehead was, I think, his favorite philosopher. And he was a Californian um, sort of magic mushroom guru, so-called, uh, working in the 70s, 80s, and 90s with his brother. And weirdly, I interviewed him for issue one of the Idler magazine, which was published in 1993. Um, now, he, he died about 10 years after that, but he was an amazing guy. He was sampled by the shaman. Um, he was taken up as a sort of a totem or icon of the rave generation. Merlin, tell me, do you remember, do you remember Terence coming around for tea? Um, what, what was the, the dinner table like with you and your, your brother Cosmo, who's um, a very talented musician, and your father, Rupert? Um, it was always fun. I mean, we spent quite a lot of time with Terence because my father would do these, tri what, what they called trialogues. Him and uh, a mathematician called Ralph Abraham uh, and Terence would gather and they would talk with each other and they'd record the conversations and turn them into books. And so every now and then they'd have to do some new trialogues. And so there was always an excuse to meet. And it was their way of um, making this time to spend with each other, which they enjoyed very much. And, and so sometimes Terence would come to England. Sometimes we would go, um, we'd be in California. Sometimes we went to visit him in Hawaii at his, his place uh, on the slopes of the volcano Mauna Loa. And it was uh, a round house set in a tropical garden a, a living library of, of psychoactive plants and, and the whole place was called the botanical dimensions. And so we'd be there, Terence would be there. I mean, he was a very good storyteller and you know, I was small at this time. So, um, and, and when and at the age of, sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you know, the way that I would relate to older people was normally through um, in a kind of storytelling way. Um, and so he, he would tell all sorts of amazing stories in that amazing voice of his. And 
and he's just so imaginative and playful and irreverent and he was very um, funny wasn't he he had that that funny sort of uh, high pecked californian sort of almost sort of whiny voice and he was ex extremely articulate i mean they said about dr johnson you know everything he said sounded like a second edition and i think that was true with terence mckenna you couldn't quite believe how he came out with these sort of beautifully formed sentences um uh you know apparently first time without reading it from a book exactly yeah and who, who else was around? Um, I'm just imagining your childhood as maybe something like Aldous Huxley, the Huxley family. You know, um, it was sort of, uh, sort of incredibly sort of intellectual um, conversations and stuff. Uh, but also, you must have at some point realised that your parents were taking drugs, or at least some of their friends were taking uh, mushrooms or, you know, psilocybin in, in a very responsible way. Yeah, well, I mean, Terence was the first person who told me about psychedelics in any kind of detail. I remember I was in I was in Hawaii and I had some earache and I was lying under a mosquito net and I saw him preparing some um, plant material in a pestle and mortar, and I assumed that it was some medicine for my earache, but it was no such thing. It was salvia divinorum, which he was going to go and take with my father and Ralph, um, which they, and and my father had he didn't enjoy it. He said it turned everything to custard, sort of dripping. Um, <laughs> custard and but um terence was growing it there and, and he wanted to um to explore it with them but so he, so terence explained that it wasn't this medicine but it was a plant that could make you dream and there are other plants and mushrooms that can make you dream and this was something that humans had done and, and for for a very long time for as long as we'd been humans and um so i was i was captivated um in this way and but yeah i mean there, there, there were psychedelic users around for sure and this was a, a, a part of um a part of the world that uh, that I grew up in, for sure. And you, you, you're also in, um, I suppose, what you could call the more sort of conventional scientific world, and that you went to Cambridge. Um, so, what was Cambridge like? Did they try and sort of uh, steer you towards a more conventional path, or were they quite open to your the stuff that you wanted to do? Well, I mean, to a certain extent, you will have to go through the you have to go through the process. Um, you have to do your exams and learn all this stuff. I, I mean, I, I was, I was disappointed in the um, exam process. There was just so much learning to do. I thought it was a waste of time. And if you want to you know, learn all this stuff, yeah, sure, you can learn all this stuff. I don't think it's going to tell them anything important about who you are or how you think. But um, the most enjoyable part of it for me was, I mean, I enjoyed doing natural sciences and plant sciences, but the history and philosophy of science was really a, a very exciting time. And uh, because you move from um, being uh, in, the, in the natural sciences where you're thinking about your subject matter, you're thinking about plants or animals or that type of plant or that type of animal. Um, you go from doing that to thinking about science itself. Science itself, the practices and, uh, and ideas of science are themselves uh, your subject matter. I always would joke with friends that if you wanted to know about a certain type of insect, ask the insect expert, as in a certain type of um, cosmological um, entity, ask the astronomer. Uh, but if you wanted to ask and there's something about science and its history and practices, then you ask the historian and philosophy of science because they study science as their subject matter and, and actually often have a much broader perspective about the way that this uh, enterprise proceeds in human life. So that was a very important part of my education and I, I'm, I'm still fascinated by these studies today. Now going back to the genesis of the book, uh, we've talked about it's called Entangled Life and you're using your introduction, this word mycelial, which comes up a lot. Now, can you just go back and talk about what mycelial means? So you, you explained very nicely that, you know, um, uh, the mushroom is just what we see, like the apple. Um, the, the mushroom is the sort of fruit, if you like, of the fungus, and most of it's underground. Uh, but how do you find out what's going on underground? I mean, we can't see it. Yeah, it's tricky. So you can grow mycelium in dishes, in labs and so a lot of the experiments into mycelial behavior has taken place in this kind of a lab environment you can put mycelial networks through microscopic labyrinths and watch them nose their way around it's a fascinating thing to see uh, but if you grow them in a dish and you know, mold on on bread is mycelium you know there's little fuzzy um circular emanations that you see um or, or on top of your jam or whatever these are all mycelial networks uh, on a smaller scale um, but so you can study them there. You can study them in this in this in vitro environment. If you want to study what's going on outside in the soil, it's much harder. But you generally have to destroy the networks you're trying to study in order to study them, which is one of these um, these awkward um, facts 
of the discipline. And um, but you can you can and when I was studying these networks in Panama, I would be taking soil samples, I'd be grinding up the DNA in the soil, and I'd be sequencing that to find out who was where, what fungal species were where, and I'd use these um, sampling points to reconstruct some kind of um, distribution map. But you you also um, well probably now famously plunged your nose deeply into the soil to um, get a sense of what was going on. Well, yeah, I mean, I spent most of my time actually in, in, in the jungle on, on my hands and knees with my head and I have my face very close to the ground. Uh, it was interesting to spend so much time in this way and to get to know an ecosystem from this point of view. Uh, it was really a special thing, actually, because I realized how much of the time I spend walking around this, this bipedal uh, arrogance. I think it gives us a narcissistic spin, just this walking on two legs. Really? And, uh, so so, is it, so, uh, that's a lovely phrase, bipedal arrogance. Um... So in order to sort of divest yourself of your two legs, you, you, you became a sort of crawling thing. I became a crawling thing because I needed to keep you know, reaching down into the soil. So, so the, the, the antidote to my bipedal arrogance was, was a natural byproduct of that. I'm very grateful for it. And literally become humble or uh, presumably humility has got something to do with humus and uh, yeah, same root. its root. And yeah, same root, same with, with human as well. So humans should be sort of basically humble. Yeah, human, humble, humus. It's all, you know, it's all. Okay, well, they, 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 let's talk about the, the, the sort of philosophy because what you talk about in the book, um, uh, and as I said, it, you know, we're all sensing it's got this sort of mystical element to it, um, is the interconnectedness. And Mark alluded to that with his stuff about Whitehead and so on at the beginning. Um, and I think I'm right to say that you mentioned Kropotkin. Now, Kropotkin's a sort of idler hero, he was the uh, sort of anti Darwinian. Um, scientist stroke anarchist philosopher. Uh, now, how does Kropotkin come into your um, study of, the, you know, the world of funguses and other cre creatures or things, plants, whatever you call them? Mm. So one of the things that, uh, one of the themes that runs through the book and one of the themes that will run through anyone's um, discussion of fungi is symbiosis, the way that organisms find to uh, live alongside each other in very intimate circumstances to share bodily space or bodily contact with each other. And this is a, just a fundamental feature of life and uh, has been recognized as such more and more over the course of the 20th century. And it's, so we have this, this view of cooperation in nature, this symbiosis, which is often a mutually beneficial. You can have organisms that, that could not do what they're doing unless they live together, unless they invented a way to live together, uh, possibly over hundreds of millions of years. And so in the late 19th century, when evolutionary theory was, was being more broadly applied and, and, and seeping out into the world, in England, the view of evolution was one of, uh, of natural selection, um, this, this sort of um, editing process. You know, life is producing these various forms and it's being edited by, um, by natural selection. And so who will survive? this editing process. And then the view was this, that the fittest, the strongest, the cunningest would survive. T.H. Huxley had that a very memorable line that life's a gladiator's show. And, um, and so these understandings of evolution, these mirrored views of human social progress within an industrial capitalist system in England and, and the evolution. Yeah, so, 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 so the point was that there were sort of, um, these views were quite convenient to the new um, survival of the fittest type capitalist uh, mill owners and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they mutually reinforced each other. So then the, you know, the, um, the mill owners would then look to this story of life to naturalize their behavior. But this story of life had itself been um, created by a certain view of the way things were happening at the time. You often have this going on in, in, in the life sciences. Um, but in Russia, there was a, a, a greater emphasis on cooperation, of course. And so um, a Kropotkin fell into this camp where what he emphasized was cooperation. You no, know, this is how a life proceeds. It's by cooperation, not by competition. So don't compete. That's his big line. Don't compete. Um, cooperate. And so, of course, we need both. Um, and so it did get it, get it got deeply entrenched along these political lines. And, and there's amazing report actually in the 60s, the first international conference for the study of symbiosis, the editors um, and the proceedings, the editors say it's no accident. This was, there was, um, happened six months after the 
Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's no accident that we've chosen this subject uh, at this moment in time when we need to think more carefully about coexistence in the human world. Um, and to think about human coexistence in the human world, maybe you can start by thinking about coexistence in the more than human world. And so now we live in a much bigger um, picture. Uh, we've entered a bigger room, it feels, where where cooperation is a part of the story of life, but so is competition. We need both. And I think of collaboration as a, as a, as a sort of blanket term, a collaboration being an alloy of competition and cooperation. That, we, that both exist at any one moment, you know, and you can have, think about your relationships with your family or with your friends, or think about, a, I often think about a jazz band. You can have a jazz band giving amazing performances, but these players might compete with each other, uh, hate each other, uh, argue with each other, and cooperate enough to produce this astonishing performance. So we're used to the interpenetration of these dynamics in, in every moment of our lives. And you see that reflected in the uh, mycelial networks of uh, organisms that are helping each other underground. And is there a sense in which you think that fungi are intelligent? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> I think we need to deepen and expand our idea of intelligence from the classical definitions. The classical definitions on the whole, they put humans at the top of a great pyramid, a great pyramid, a great chain of intelligence. Use our intelligence and our style and manner of cognition as a yardstick by which to judge uh, the cognitive capacities of other organisms. And I guess this makes sense on some level um, because we think of ourselves as the center of our lives. And so it's, it's a forgivable, um, it's a forgivable mistake. Sin. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think maybe we can be a bit more mature now. And um, and so this is a general trend in the biological sciences at the moment to, to think more broadly about what is meant by cognition and intelligence. And most definitions now, there are many on offer. Most of them involve uh, the ability to uh, choose between different courses of action, um, to make decisions, to um, adapt, flexibly adapt to changes in one's environment, um, to solve problems. And so within these more expanded definitions um, and these ideas of cognition, it actually seems that just to be alive, you need to be cognizant to some degree. Now, all organisms are to some degree cognizant because to be a living organism, you have to be able to uh, make certain choices between different courses of action. You have to be able to adapt to your immediate circumstances. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be alive for long. So actually, now the picture of intelligence has, it has become this big spectrum. And uh, Darwin's, Darwin's definition was possibly the most helpful. He said that intelligence was the ability of an organism to do what it needed to do in order to survive. And I like this because it's not just pragmatic, but he puts it firmly in terms of whatever that organism needs or wants. It would make no sense, for example, for a plant to have a brain. It can't run away. Um, if an animal came off and you know, grazed that centralized place, the brain, um, then it would be screwed. Uh, as it is, you can graze 90% of a plant it was, and some plants and they'll sprout back, no problem. So for them and for fungi, it makes much more sense to distribute their problem solving faculties. And so and that, that is, that is, that's what spores are about, is it? Well, spores are a way of dispersing. So spores are a bit like seeds um, in plants. They're a way of, of a fungus getting from A to B without having to grow from A to B. Hmm. That's the spore. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about psilocybin? Uh, you're not afraid to try different things uh, in the book. Um, you report your cider experiences alongside LSD, I think, and psilocybin experiences. Some scientists uh, of mushrooms and similar things would sort of wouldn't try the supply, so to, so to speak. But you clearly haven't. Um, what's the point of you know psilocybin and, and taking magic mushrooms? Because I mean, there, there seems to be something more deep to it than uh, you know sort of cocaine or ecstasy. Well, I think most psychedelics or entheogens, as they're sometimes known, entheogen meaning um, a substance that can elicit an experience of, of the divine. And these substances do very different things from, say, cocaine or from alcohol. Um, and they, uh, my experience of psychedelics is generally one of finding myself in what is a much larger mental place. My mind suddenly is, I realize it's much larger than, than the mind I not spend my daily life in. Um, it, exp it extends far beyond 
um, the places I normally live in. It's like living in one room of your house and suddenly you realize, like, oh, wow, there's, a, there's upstairs, there's downstairs, there's a cellar, there's an attic, there's even a garden, there's a forest beyond the garden. Um, so I find them helpful and healthy in that way to explore uh, the possibilities of my mind. And um, well, that's sort of, I guess, a very simple way of saying it. But the, um, so yeah, I mean, people find different benefits in, in taking psychedelics. Some people so, use them to do all sorts of yeah, different things. And, um, but you're, you're, as I said earlier, you're the sort of Aldous Huxley of our generation. He uh, famously took mescaline, I think in the late 50s or early 60s and kicked off a psychedelic revolution, which was sort of derailed in the late 60s um, with the war on drugs and so on. Now, I just want to ask before we sort of move on, um, well, two things. Uh, there's something about look, your book, which is sort of so well-timed. I mean, it's like a sort of draft of good sense and uh, a, a sort of light that people need right now. Um, have you had that sense when you've been reading the reviews and, you know, people reading it, letters from readers that um, uh, somehow it's been, the publication has been sort of timed well by luck or whatever? Definitely. It feels very much like it's timed well. And the book feels like it It found me. I didn't want to, it wasn't an ambition to write a book. And there was just a, a, a few, a, a cascade of circumstances that led to it happening and then led to the timing happening and then it being postponed to this more fungal month, as you said before, when we were chatting. And, well, we were saying, um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of, <laughs> originally the book, I think, was going to be published in May. Um, and I read it earlier in the year and then it was postponed because of, Covid and so on, um, and now it's come out in in September, uh, which does feel quite much for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me it feels very much like it, the book feels like a kind of mushroom that's a, a fruiting of many different things, and it's felt very much out of my hands, and I've just trusted this process, and um, and it's you know so it, it doesn't surprise me that it's timing itself well because I feel like it's got its own kind of timing its own schedule and I just have to let that happen and get out of the way yeah you've got to sort of go with the flow with this this larger thing of the of the, of the work that you created the, the the creation that um uh has come from your pen mm. um now before we go to questions and another word from Mark it is autumn and you know a lot of us are stuck at home what would you say to someone who you know having read your book oh, that's the first step obviously but um if you want to explore this world for ourselves uh, and go into the woods and the hedgerows. How do we do that? Is there a, could you give us a kind of couple of tips of how to keep our minds, noses open? There are so many ways to do it. I mean, you can, you can brew, you can brew alcohol um, with the yeast and do that at home. And that's a way to have a fungal process in your life. Um, yeasts being fungi, of course. And but you can do the more conventional, you can outside and look for mushrooms. And that's always a very exciting thing to do. And it changes the way that you see and experience. At least I, I find this and many others who I know who do this find this, that when you open your senses to these organisms, which are usually far down below you, although some grow on trees. And, um, but you start to see and experience the, the place you're, you're in in a different way. And that can be itself. If you find no mushrooms, that can be a very exciting thing. Um, it's not necessarily about finding mushrooms that you would want to eat, just finding, and then, and then learning how to look them up. It's a process, and you know, mushroom identification is a, is a journey that you never, uh, you never reach the end of. But I find just that process a very exciting one, a way to tune into being outside in a new way. Uh, you can also grow mushrooms inside in your home. That's, that's really exciting too, because you can see them growing. You can get mushroom grow kits very easily, and you spray them with water, and these organisms will sprout um, before your eyes. They grow incredibly fast. And that's, that, that's a lot of wonder there. I, I, I never cease to wonder at watching these mushrooms grow. Uh, I, I think Terence McKenna published a book about how to grow your own magic mushrooms, which has uh, um, sold quite well. Is that right? It sold very well. It sold uh, 100,000 copies in, in five years. It was, <laughs> it was the magic, mushrooms growers, magic Mushroom Growers Guide. He published it with his brother Dennis under, under pseudonyms, and it really kicked off a... Um, a major movement in mushroom cultivation. Yeah, it's a big deal. Well, it's, I was it's... very struck in your book, Merlin, by how um, mushrooms are going to invade our lives in all sorts of other ways, though. They're going to become a building material and all sorts of things. And I loved, I loved when you kept making the jest about how um, mushrooms have organized us to spread their spores. 
you know, there was, there was, there was, there was mushrooms as a building material, but also truffles and all sorts of things. But we're already kind of organizing ourselves around their organization. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's so important you know, to, to, to decenter our control narratives. And you can see it with flowers. And you know, if flowers have evolved to manipulate animals, it's a very basic thing. It's, it's not controversial. It's just evidently true. And um, and especially when you see these 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 flowers that mimic the you know these orchid bees that look like sexually receptive female bees to lure male bees, um, and the male bees literally mate with the flower. It's inter it's inter kingdom uh, sex. It's amazing. It's, it's deeply erotic. And um, and so these ways that the, and and so it, what the dynamic is there is it could be, you know, is it manipulation? Is it just courtship? It, you know, how, you know, it's, just, it's an astonishing thing. And so with truffles, it's, it's you know, are we being manipulated or are we just uh, succumbing to this um, courtship? Or you know, these dynamics are up to us to to interpret. And so I like having lots of stories at once, which is why I like flipping the narrative. Just tell us a little bit about um, uh, building materials and so on as well, because I didn't know anything about that actually. It's already quite a big industry. Yeah, the building materials is big. So, because my, so mycelium, you can encourage mycelium to grow in any number of uh, substrates. And so one of the ways that the building materials are working, if you, you get sort of damp sawdust and you put it into molds, say if you want a brick, you'd make a brick shaped mold, uh, a lamp shade, you can make a lamp shaped mold. And then you encourage the mycelium to grow through this sawdust and it, it encases the sawdust in a, and it makes a kind of composite material. Um, a bit like you can imagine as a sort of um, MDF, which is you know, a sort of resin holding, get holding together sawdust. This is a fungus holding together sawdust. And these materials uh, have all sorts of amazing properties um, and can be grown on two weeks on waste materials. And so lots of packaging materials are now made from this. Dell ship thousands of servers a year using mycelial packaging. IKEA are revising their entire uh, product line to include mycelial packaging. Um, That's amazing. Good deal, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I, I just remembered um, Merlin, you got some videos for us. Oh yeah, uh, that we're going to play. So let's let's have a look at those just before we, we go to questions. We will just show one of those. Um, so these videos, I was. Um, is this working? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was in Panama, I was always trying to. And I was looking at the way that plants and fungi live together, and, and it's a very ancient relationship called the mycorrhizal association, which is when. Uh, which almost all plants depend on fungi that live in their roots and extend into the soil. And the fungi are very deft rangers in the wilderness of the soil and can find nutrients and water and supply their plant partners with these nutrients and water in return for the sugars and lipids the plants make in photosynthesis. So it's a life-giving association that underpins uh, all life on land. And so I was studying this relationship and I was always wondering, what is it like inside a root? I want to go inside a root. I want to travel inside a root. I really want to experience this intimacy. And so I, I went to Germany to work with some master um, microscope uh, users, microscopists, and, um, and got these root scans. And so you stain the fungus with one stain and, and the root with another. And so, and you get these three-dimensional scans. So here you see the plant materials in blue, green, the fungus is in red. And, and this was, a, and so you can see quite how much of this root is fungus, that the fungus is a prosthetic organ of the plant's body and the plant is in some sense a prosthetic organ of the fungus's body. Um, in fact, plants, uh, you can think of plants as algae that have evolved to farm fungi and fungi that have evolved to farm algae. So plants are actually sort of allowing fungi to grow within their roots because it helps them. Not just allowing, encouraging them. Um, the plants wouldn't survive without them. I mean, plants also have fungi living in their leaves and their shoots. Um, so what, do the, what do the fungi in the leaves and shoots sort of do for the plant? They do various, various things. They can, uh, they defend them from disease and, and from herbivores. Um, they can um, help them resist drought. They can help them make their metabolisms more efficient. Uh, there's all sorts of benefits. And so it's really, it's really impossible to think about plant life without thinking about fungal life as well. Absolutely amazing. Victoria, have we got some questions? We've got loads of questions. So um, I'm going to uh, ask you to ask them quickly, everybody. Um, Justin, could you ask your question first and then we'll have 
Andy, followed by Susanna. Um, let's do you three first and see how we get on. Hi, Merlin. I'd like to know who you consider your uh, top forerunners or, or influences. Hmm. That's a tricky question. I don't know. In different ways, there are different people. Um, people who have been very helpful in the writing of this book are Donna Haraway for her amazing, unrelenting focus on, on kinship, on relationships, and on different ways of being creative, that organisms have been creative about forming relationships with each other. Um, and then, um, oh gosh, that's hard. Um, there are some very big people in the fungal world that have, that have really done a lot to, to um, expand and deepen the study of, of, of mycology. Paul Stamets is a big figure and I've known him for years and he's inspired me since I was a teenager. Um, hard not to be inspired by Paul. He, he, he's just he's a ceaseless torrent of fungal enthusiasm. <laughs> but um, but there, have, there have been so many people. Um, th those, two, those two come to mind right away. Brilliantly put, a ceaseless torrent of fungal enthusiasm. <laughs> We can't hear you actually, Victoria, because it because, because unmute you there. No, we still can't hear you. There. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Sorry, I'm so sorry. So Andy, we're really, we're waiting for Andy and Susanna to speak. Are you there, Andy? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, you said at one point, Merlin, about how we would have to change our idea or our, our, our sense of what constitutes intelligence, um, g g given the sort of things you talk about. Um, and I know there's a whole kind of tendency to talk about, you know, to recognise intelligence out in the world, but it's, it's often defined in a quite functional way, that intelligence is just the ability to respond to events in a meaningful way, in a structured way. So I wondered whether during your research and your and your thinking on this, you you developed any intuitions as to whether there's an awareness that goes with that in, in intelligence and whether, you know, ultimately there's there might be something it's like to be a mycelium. Yeah, it's it's a big one. Yes, the intelligence can be described exactly as you say in these very functional terms and very conveniently avoid this big thorny question of consciousness, of, of, of the subjective awareness of these organisms. Is there something exactly as you say, like it's, uh, that it's like to be a fungus? And the way that I got into this question, the way that I found it most helpful to start thinking about this question was to think about these, uh, to think about fungi as, as sensitive bodies. They are sensing so many things in their environment. They're subjected to um, all these changes in their, their uh, surrounding conditions that they must notice, they must pay attention to in their way. Um, they're sensitive to heat, to light, to endless chemicals, to acidity, to pressure. Um, they're often very sensitive to these different stimuli. Within fungal networks, uh, the, the sensory data these data streams flow through these fungal networks and they somehow are integrated in these fungal networks and, and allow the fungus to make a suitable response to any of those conditions. And, and so as sensitive bodies, um, they are, um, I, you know, then, then, you, then you hit the wall, you know, it, does, the fungus, uh, does the fungus have a subjective experience of the sensitivity or is it sensitive without, uh, without um, having a awareness of that. And, and of course, we can never really know. It's very hard to know that the philosophers of mind always get tangled up with the zombie problem, which is that, that we can never really know if another human is conscious, um, let alone another more than human. Um, so I'm agnostic about this, but I do like to keep the question open because uh, we don't have grounds to close it down uh, with a negative answer for sure. Great, amazing. Could we... Um... We've got Susanna, could you ask your question? Yes, I'm sorry, I haven't read your book yet. So this, you probably discussed this in depth about the relationship and interdependence um, of, between uh, fungi and trees. I'm really fascinated by this and you have already dis discussed this briefly now, but if you could say a little bit more about this, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's really, 
<clears throat> the way that the way that the thing that puzzles like uh, well amazes me uh, perhaps most about this is is how it arose like in the earliest days of life on land about 500 million years ago when the land was scorched and desolate place this was not somewhere where life was happening in a bustling way and the sea life was kicking off there were mollusks were thriving there were nine foot long sea scorpions corals were forming reefs uh, all sorts of evolutionary innovation was taking place in the sea and um, for these algal ancestors of land plants to make it onto the land, all sorts of things needed to happen to them. Um, they were used to floating in a kind of nutrient broth of these freshwater lakes and rivers. And when they started to wash up on the soggy shores of these bodies of water, uh, they were faced with the challenge of finding nutrients and water in, in these young soils that they, um, that they were now um, dependent on. And fungi are amazing um, explorers of these kind of solid media and so in this earliest moment, these fungi and these plants got together, all the ancestors of plants got together and the fungi dealt with the ground and the plant, the alga, alga dealt with the light. And so you have this fundamental polarity that underpins all subsequent plant evolution. And so for 50 or 60 million years before plants evolved their own roots, fungi were their root systems. And so this relationship is a more fundamental part of planthood than roots, uh, fruit, wood, uh, leaves, flowers. Um, and I just, I, this never ceases to, uh, to astonish me. And so any discussion of these relationships is happening within that context. And, and there's so much to say on this, but I think I probably should stop there. Merlin, can I just ask you about the book Fungus the Bogeyman? Um, I'm sure other journalists have, have asked you this question. I used to love Fungus the Bogeyman by Raymond Briggs, um, but it, it, it may have uh, about a sort of um, inverse world where they, they loved uh, you know mushrooms and sort of moisture and so on um i mean it was it was quite a sort of beautiful book in a way but it might have done something to sort of damage the reputation of the fungus in general um by portraying it in a sort of negative light and fungus the bogeyman is obviously a bit sort of dirty and uh, often quite miserable did you read that book and um uh, are, are you sort of trying to react against it in any way i actually never have read the book and uh, maybe that's why <laughs> maybe that's why i'm so interested in fungi um, but I, I mean, it's definitely a problem that uh, our attitudes towards uh, fungi can be um, so troubled, you know, that they can be limited to an experience of mold or you know, soggy supermarket bus and mushrooms that you're made to eat when you're a child. And when these organisms underpin um, all the life systems that we exist within. So um, maybe if I had read it, I'd also have written this book as a way to try and uh, counteract it, as you say. But <laughs> So it's hard to know. Um, we've got a question from Rachel. Could you line yourself up? Um, uh, but we've also had a question from Lisa, and she's too shy to ask, which is, what is the point of, what is the usefulness of fungi in human bodies? That's a really good question. And, and there aren't actually lots of good answers for that um, as for most good questions but so so we, we have microbiome you know our microbiome is all the microbes that live in and on us and many of you i'm sure would have heard of this and there's a lot of work being done on this um, and we depend uh, a huge amount on bacteria that live in and on us but we also depend on fungi that live in and on us our microbiome as it's known and um, there's the most recent research is suggesting that these it's been much neglected compared to the bacteria that these fungi are outnumbered by bacteria on our body um, and in our body but it seems that they play important roles in regulating our immune responses and um, certainly yeasts which line our orifices our ears our nostrils um, and they uh, play defensive roles. They keep out other organisms. And just as they do on the skins of fruit, you'll have seen that little dusty coating on grapes um, or plums. And these are the coating of yeast, which, um, which help to defend the fruit from, from other um, less beneficial microorganisms. So we have a similar coating of yeast. Um, so that's the sort of clearest benefit that I know of. Um, otherwise, you're left with this, and it's very difficult in microbiome studies to work out who's doing what exactly, because they're all working together all at once, and to separate cause and effect is, is a nightmare. Uh, so, so I've read studies where, where um, yes, these, these members of our microbiome 
uh, are doing important things with regard to various uh, bodily functions, but exactly what and exactly how uh, isn't quite known, but it's a, it's a fast moving um, field of study. And so I think we'll find out more quite soon. Well, what are you drinking this evening? Beer, beers obviously uh, wouldn't be possible without fungus. Yeah, no, no, no booze would be possible without fungus. Um, I'm drinking a, a Gers, a mixed lambic beer. I love these sour beers from, from Belgium, which are made with wild yeasts. They have these big flat dishes in the rafters of the breweries that catch these wild yeasts from the air. And you end up with these really complex flavors because you're not just using this one strain of yeast, which does one thing. Uh, you have this complex community and they're all relating to each other. And, and so you have these, these amazing um, sour tastescapes. And so then it's a girls, but with them, they mix in cherry juice, which then undergoes a secondary ferment. And so you have this, um, end up with this really beautiful um, liquid. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. So you're, you're sort of an amazing beer expert as well. Can you hold up the glass or have you already finished it? <laughs> I'm afraid it. It's empty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a shame. We should have done that in the beginning, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you got another question, Vic? Um, you've gone a bit quiet again. Oh, we can't hear you. There you go, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Rachel, are you there? Rachel and then John Hughes, if you're there. No, Rachel. John Hughes, can I, you I'm ask? A, I'm a Rachel. Uh, I may be. Did you ask a question, Rachel? Was it yours? Um... I might have done. I, I've, I've said two things. One is something yeah, to do with so, uh, pan psychism. Pan okay. psychism. Okay, so so one was about uh, uh, growing your own mushrooms, and the other one is is I'd be very okay. interested in your uh, view on on panpsychism because you're talking about the nature of intelligence, and um, you know people have been talking about complexity in the comments, and the idea that um, there is a level of quote consciousness at a subatomic level um, does that kind of is that something that excites you or something that you just think I'd rather not go there no I, I have a lot of time for panpsychism and of course there are lots of different ways to be a panpsychist and um but on the whole the motivation for panpsychism I find that enormously compelling you know how can we have this you know if we, we, we're asked to believe that matter is uh, purposeless feelingless meaningless and yet we know in our own lives and our own experience that we have you know, purposeful meaningful feelingful existence uh, how can we be made up of purposeless feelingless meaningless matter and yet have this uh, purpose meaning and feeling arise in our own lives this is the hard problem of consciousness that it should not be possible given our understanding of matter given this reductive understanding of matter uh, to have something called consciousness at all something like consciousness at all um, so this demands some explanation and so panpsychism has found its way into a quite mainstream debates uh, within philosophy of mind uh, for this reason, because it pr promises a way out of uh, this hard problem, because if consciousness is somehow a basic fundamental feature of matter, then um, then the hard problem sort of goes away because we're made of these um, these little drops of consciousness. And so we form this big, um, more complex type of consciousness. And so this is one way of thinking about it. And um, I find Whitehead's way of thinking about it very helpful uh, as well. And um, he was a panpsychist, a panexperientialist, perhaps we call, I would say, and that the experience is, is fundamental, um, that all, um, that the fundamental unit of existence in the whole universe are drops of experience, and that we ourselves are a complex amplifiers of experience, that our bodies have evolved to become more and more complex amplifiers of experience, and so that's why we have um, our, our rich a nuanced texture of experience that, that we're familiar with as humans. Um, with panpsychism, there's all sorts of fun questions if you extend it, and it's often talked about in the very reductive terms as, as just as electrons might be conscious. But of course, if electrons are conscious and if that makes us conscious, then what about the very, very large beings in the uh, cosmos like stars or galaxies? Uh, I think that this is a part of panpsychism which has perhaps been underexplored, but which is nonetheless implied uh, by these developments. I'd be very happy to see this talked about more. 
Wow. And uh, Rachel, you had another question, and I think we will have to end after this, but it is useful. The, the grow your own mushroom companies, there was one in the USA that Rachel knew about, and I think you know about. Is there one in, in the UK? Oh, yeah. Um, there's a great um, company called Grow Cycle, and Grow Cycle sell oyster mushroom grow kits. Uh, they specialize in oyster mushrooms. And so I can uh, heartily recommend Grow Cycle. And um, there are other um, various different mushroom grow kits, um, grow kit suppliers in the UK. And um, there's one called, I think called Anne's Fungi. Um, is that right? Yeah, Amazing. Anne's, I, I think Anne, if you search for Anne Fungus Grow Kit UK or something like that, um, you can get um, more exotic grow kits from Holland. And you can also get um, various different Part, you can you can buy mushroom spawn which you can use to create your own kind of grow kit as well and you can buy that from um, from Anne's Fungi. you can also buy that from a place called uh, Mycenium in Belgium um, there are a few places depending on how serious you want to get are you going to do your own fungal bodysuit <laughs> <laughs> when you die sorry I've been very rude but it's just such an obsession of mine that uh, uh -huh. <sighs> well I just saw that the um there's a, not the fungal body suit, but a different group in, in, in the Netherlands had just been making, growing these coffins in, in the way I described using these mycelial composites. And, um, but treating them in a way that the fungus hadn't you know, totally um, died. When, often when they're, they're baked in kilns and the fungus is then killed. But I think they did it in a way where they just dried it at room temperature, the fungus could actually come back um, and start behaving like a fungus again. And so certainly a fungal coffin uh, would be fun. The grow suits, I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard enough about, you know, what type of fungi they are. Would they really eat my flesh? You know, is it, or is it just a, a sort of more of a, a con concept? Um, I, I just, I haven't found that enough yet about those. Wow, well, that's a very spooky way to end, which we <laughs> are sadly going to have to end. Merlin, thank you so very much. Tom, thank you. Mark, thank you.